Ladies and gentlemen, returning to YouTube, the ever popular Australian Watch Authority, Time and Tide. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Craig Willis, the voice of Australia. They say you should never waste a crisis. I am not wasting this one because I've always wanted to do this. I have my pencil, I have my Letterman mug. We are ready for 10 brands to unveil over 25 new watches in the next however long this takes. Uh, we also have some special guests, including the deputy editor of Time and Tide, Nicholas Kenyon. Nick, come on down, come on in, my friend. That's not Nick, no. Nick is coming up later, but we start with this footage of Chris Farley, RIP Chris, best entrance ever, because this is how we enter watch fairs. And what this video is about really, aside from discovering watches, is learning about what it's like to go on a watch fair. And I will spoil the suspense. This is how it starts. We roll off a plane in Geneva at the Pal Expo, and we are wired. We are so full of energy, we're so um, jet lagged, we're still probably drunk from the plane. This is all real. And then you will see through footage that we have of what happens and then we're gonna get into the watches. Before we begin, you might have noticed there have been some changes. Firstly, I look like an extra from The Revenant. Now this is because obviously we can't have haircuts in Australia that last for longer than 30 minutes, and I need more than that. Secondly, I believe that I'm in a hashtag Corona beard battle with Adam Craniotes. Adam, I see you, I'm still taking you down. Number two, you'll notice that I'm alone. This is strange for me. Time and Tide is usually a bustling place. As it is now, it's just Jen and I complying with social distancing regulations and doing this in a very different format. Number three, we do not have watches. We have beautiful imagery and we have all the embargoed information here. However, there is a twist. There is one watch from a very popular brand here in packaging unopened. We are going to open this at some point through the program. We'll get to that. Before we begin, a wrist check. What am I wearing? It's the IWC Big Pilot Le Petit Prince. 46.2 millimeters, which is unbelievable when you consider that this is how it looks on Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, his airness, the goat, is a huge Big Pilot fan. He owns several, we discovered them this week, and they look 36 millimeter on the big guy. Not so much on me. If you'd like to shout out what you're wearing, hit us up in the comments, and this goes for everything. Now, in the virtual watch fair intention, we want you to get involved. So as you see the watches we unveil, we wanna hear which ones stand out. And engagement is what we want, which is why we have a copy of both editions of our magazine, Now Magazine, here. We are going to be giving away collector's packs of both magazines to people who get involved in the comments. Issue one, there's only a handful of copies of that left, so it's quite a, quite a prize. Right, let's get into how the watch fair would start if we were on one together right now. It would start like this. We would enter the Pal Expo in Geneva, which is where Watches and Wonders was meant to be. And you'll see, we walk through security. So here we are, S-I-H-H. -H. Now you might ask yourself, how is this fair this atmosphere different to Basel World. Allow me to explain in interpretive music. This is Basel World. This is SIHH. Done. No narrative, enough. Lovely music playing. And we enter the main hall. You will see here that the hall is populated by very opulent, beautiful booths, and one by one we would go in and explore the watches, which is what we're going to do now, starting with Bohm and Mercier. Now this year, Bohm and Mercier have two new collections that are, or two extensions of two collections, starting with the Hampton. Now the Hampton has always been a more refined and dressy uh, watch compared to the Clifton. Um, 
And this year, the main change here is a change to the silhouette. We have a rectangular style case that really evokes that 1920s Art Deco style. And it doesn't take much Googling to spin through just how many archival designs Bowman Mercier had to choose from for this one. Um, my pick of the options is the large automatic, which is 48 by 31 mil which has a really interesting and, and I think well-placed little pop of red at the 60 second mark on the uh, sub dial for seconds. Also, the price of that one, by the way, is 3,950 on leather strap and that's an automatic, not a quartz movement. There are some quartz movements in the smaller sizes. Next, we have the Bowman Mercier Clifton Baumatic Day Date Moon Phase. Now this is really a contender for me for one of the best watches of the fair. It is that gorgeous Calatrava style Clifton case with a moon phase complication at six. This uh, graduated dial, which really does quite dramatically change tone from the outer edges to the middle and quite a cleverly executed day and date with a day in a circular uh, sub dial of sorts uh, at 12 and the date being a ring of numbers around the moon phase. So a lot of creativity here. In steel, I think this is a great buy in Australia at $6,900. And in rose gold, that is $18,600. But again, a really handsome Clifton. It's proved to be a very versatile case. Uh, this is an absolutely stunning watch. Can't wait to see this in the metal. GG Le Cult. We have three new watches from JLC and we're calling in a friend of ours, Sandra Lane, who is in New Zealand to talk us through this collection. I have my handy Bluetooth uh, headphones ready to go and we're gonna cross to Zoom and ask Sandra what she thinks of this new collection. Hello, Sandra. Hey, Andrew. Not in, here we are, not in Geneva. Not, we are so not in Geneva. Where, where are you? I'm in New Zealand. I got stranded here when I was visiting some family members back in, <laughs> at the end of February, beginning of March. Um, and here I am. Pity levels are very low considering that spectacular backdrop. But I just wonder, this is a new challenge for us. Can we talk about watches when we're not you know, knocking around the halls of the Pal Expo in Geneva. Should we try this? Should we t try and talk about Gégé Le Coult and see how we go? I, th I think so. You know, I, it, what's most unusual for me and for you and for all of us, our colleagues, is that we're not able to handle any of the watches in the metal. And that's like really strange. I mean, I think we're very lucky in that a lot of the collections are let's say they are revivals or changes or adaptations of previous collections. So we have fortunately been able to hold some of their, the, these watches predecessors in our yes. hands before. So that's a big help. We've held master controls and I think that's where we should start. It's a, it's a manly beginning, the one-two punch. Yeah, I think, you know, master control, it's, it's been a pillar of J.J. Le uh, collections for a long time. It sometimes gets a little forgotten is the wrong word, it's too, that's, that's not fair. Not forgotten, but let's say, because it is such a classic, amazing collection, and it's, um, it's all about just being really good technically, um, without spectacular bells and whistles, no gimmicks, nothing, you know, we tend to slightly forget about it. And I think Jeju Lecourt has done a lovely job this year in reintroducing the collection with a new case, new dials, it's just given a contemporary tweak, a new feel to it, and a lot of technical updates as well. Do you have any sexy facts about uh, some of these updates that, that have stood out to you? Because it is, it's to the naked eye, you know, this is, this is gonna be a trained eye that needs to, to really pull out some of these details that have been upgraded or changed. Yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of the aesthetic, the, the case is subtly different, and if you were to hold old and new right side by side, you'd see it. But where they've been, the designs have been clever is that they haven't changed it so much to have changed its identity. So mm -hmm. for example, the bezel is more open, the lugs are a bit sleeker. You know, there's just all of these subtle changes that make it 
feel more contemporary. Same with the dials, they've gone for a, a silver ray, sun ray, sorry, sun ray brushed silvery opaline, which again just looks very cool, very modern, you know, no gimmicks. I, I mean, I like it a lot. Mm. Technically, I think the most Im important thing is that the power reserves have been increased, which makes it really great for a watch that you want to wear every day, you know, mm. or take off for the weekend, put on your sporty watch and come back to this for the weekdays. So that long power reserve is, is a real plus. I'm a real stickler for symmetry, Sandra, as you probably know, and I find the master control calendar just one of the most beautifully ex executed calendar watches uh, of recent times. It, it, it's classic and yet still, as you say, some of these updates have made it really contemporary as well, which is a tough balancing act. But the symmetry is, is just perfect. Yeah. You know, it's, it's beautiful. And going back to the mid 20th century, Zsa was and recognized as arguably the expert in calendar watch movements and it supplied movements to a lot of the other great houses as well as producing it did, them under its own brand. And we haven't seen this triple display calendar with a moon phase at Jeju for a while, but what they've done is, as you say, they've taken that beautifully symmetrical, balanced, classical arrangement of the displays and just put it in a more contemporary crisper setting. Mm. Um, thing by the way if, when you look down to the bottom of the dial you see the calendar hand which has the little red j um, icon on it you'll see it jumps from about hour four to hour eight and that's because i mean it's a re it's an added complication and they've done it because they don't want to hide the moon phase at any point which i think <laughs> is really cool Yes, no, I see. There's the from 15 to 16. There's there's quite a smiley face of of text that just reminds you exactly what it is, which is uh, you know uh, a I mean, it's watch. almost you know it's almost a 45 degree jump, and that's mm. you know to put that extra complication into the watch just so you that's can a enjoy really the good moon point. Phase more, I think it's you, great. You'd be pretty excited at, at around about uh, what is that. Uh, you know that that time of the month just to watch watch that happen. Yeah, it's like, it's like one of those party trick complications, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. Very good point. Now, also, yeah. we have a reverso to match the was the boutique edition from twenty nineteen for men in red. If I may just pause as well, there's a there's in the master control. There's a simple three hands plus date, and yes. you know, as we all know, people either love or loathe date windows, but. What Zsa has done here, it's a very Zsa Lecoultre refinement. They've put a lovely little fillet around the date window, so it doesn't look like just a hole cut in the dial so you can see the date. They've yes. really, again, they've been thoughtful about it, but added that refinement so that it means something. Do you know, that actually reminds me of, I'm wearing a big pilot today, and the, right. five, the 5002 uh, uh, big pilot had a like a coppery, window around the date uh, date window. It had like a little aperture that was it was applied. And I loved that detail. And unfortunately, yeah. it is nowhere to be seen on this model. I, I actually think that I would probably trade this for a 5002 for that simple detail. So I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And then onto the Reverso, you know, yes. another absolute classic. Um, it's no exaggeration to say that it, that design is an icon of 20th century watchmaking in the proper sense of the word icon. Um, and the Reverso one is the, it's the more refined, classically feminine one because it's narrower, it's a, the case is narrower, um, it's just slimmer overall and in fact it's closer to the design of the very first ladies Reverso back in 1931. But you know, generally the colors have always been very restrained, you know, ivory or silvery dials and so on. And, you know, because it's a very refined watch. And now, bam, we've got this amazing <laughs> wine red color with a shiny strap that matches it. And it's suddenly lifted the Reverso one into a whole new world. And I mean, I can see a lot more like younger women, a lot less conservative taste, you know, like really jumping on this. I think it's, it's a fantastic look. I have a little story for you. Um, oh, yeah. The first watch sold in the Sydney uh, Gégé Le Coultre uh, boutique was the boutique edition red reverso for men. So this is a, 
think. color for the for the genders, isn't it? It's not not it, it has neither male nor female characteristics necessarily. Yeah, it's it's right. The, I mean, and this new red is not exactly the same, but it's very reminiscent of that special anniversary model done for men. Um, but it's even more vivid. And um, mm. and what's nice as well is they've got the guillotage under the red lacquer. Um, so it's very subtle. There's a bit of texture there. You know, there's all that. There's just that extra specialness. And um, those the white numerals pop against it. And that new, again, that font is particular to the Reverso one. And when you look at it closely, it almost, look, it almost has that quality of being hand-drawn, like as if it's hand-painted yes. on the dark. It is, it's but, beautiful. But best of all, it's that red. It's just, it's such a wow, you know, and it's so different for Reverso one. And Sandra, there's, uh, you haven't mentioned the little bit of ice, I see. Yeah, yeah, ice is nice. <laughs> um, the Reverso one always does have, you know, the row of diamonds above and below. It's a characteristic of all the Reverso ones, as opposed to the classic Reverso, the midsize mm. and so on. But it's nice, huh? And to, and to be able to get that as well, that little sparkle, the bright red and the steel, the contrast, the play of colors is lovely. And it's Jeja's entry level price, which is amazing. Yes. Well, I think I think you're right. I really do feel that the it's all about that the the numerals as well. I mean, while it's, it has all these fundamental reverso one characteristics, I, I think in particular there's something very special about that font. Um, wonderful, Sandra. We have wrapped up Gégé Le Coutre. Uh, Great. Right. I think we could move on to and another I brand. Say, I would say yeah. Andrew too. It's it's like Gégé going back to what it does best, mm. which is not, not showing off just. Fantastic watchmaking without any without any gimmicks at all, brought up to you know given a new contemporary twist. I like it. Piaget, the kings of thin, are back with almost inconceivably thin watches this year. I still have Sandra Lane on Zoom in New Zealand. Sandra, two millimeters yes. thick. Hi, I I immediately think two millimeters thick. I, I just assume they're talking about the movement alone, but they're not. The two millimeters refers to the, the case. The entire watch. Mm -hmm. um, it's absolutely astonishing, isn't it? Like, and before, before I go any further, I sort of have to declare an interest in Piaget Ultra Thin because this is <laughs> one, of <my> absolute, <laughs> one of my absolute favorites, right? I see That's you. That's the color of the 90s. My piece is from the early 1970s. In this watch, this caliber 9P, was, which was developed in 1957, if you can believe it, the, the movement in this watch is two millimeters thick. So now Piaget has taken us to the entire watch being two millimeters thick. And that means like two credit cards piled one on top of the other. It's insane. In, so in we're back to, it is, it is beautifully insane. And it, we're back to world record territory yet again for Piaget. This is a little bit like two, this is like, uh, I don't know, let me think, Rafael Nadal and uh, Federer just duking it out, taking yeah. trophies back off each other. So it's key, the world's thinnest. Yeah. Uh, the, key, the key thing to realize here is this is the watch that um, Piaget presented two years ago as a concept watch. The concept, yeah. And as we know, it's, it's one thing to do a concept watch, a one-off piece, and it's quite another to prove that you can, you can make it in series, you can make it in quantity, and that's what this new release is. They took the concept, the concept watch from two years ago, and they are now, this is now a production piece. They've kept the word concept because, because they can, I guess, but yeah. it's, this, is, this is the production version of that one-off concept piece that they did two years ago. And it's, it's astonishing how they've managed to do it. Just rethinking how to construct a movement, rethinking the relationship between you know, the movement components and the case, you know, the case is now is integrated into the movement. It's, it's effectively the base plate. They've reworked every wheel. I mean, the wheels, some of the wheels are like 0 0.12 <laughs> millimeters thick. That's nuts. It is. And, and it. the Semi interplay between the wheels and the, the dial, thick. you know, the, there's really the, the way that the architecture has, has come yeah. together is extraordinary and it's it's actually very attractive too sometimes these things can become just 
engineering objects, whereas this remains a thing of beauty in terms of its, its, uh, its aesthetics. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, the aesthetic is really, it's just, it's a beautiful looking watch as well as being mm. a piece of amazing engineering. We actually had the, the concept piece in the office uh, for an, an event with Piaget and it was like feeding time at the zoo in that moment. Uh, we'll probably throw up a picture of it just up here, but there was a, a real, uh, I think that there was just a sense of a frenzy really when, when people realized that they could touch this watch and that they could, they were interacting with a watch unlike any other. So it's, uh, it's got some serious, for a thin and diminutive object, it is powerful. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And you know, that, that, that's the thing too, I think what's interesting is Piaget has taken this approach to making an ultra thin watch to show us what it's made of, like really to show us what it's made of from the front which is a completely different aesthetic approach from Bulgari, which is the other you know, record yes. breaker these the, the past years. And Bulgari's approach has been from the back, you can see what we've done, but from the front, it's all about the sculpture that sits on your wrist. And I think it's so interesting having these two yeah. completely different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, something else, Andrew, that's, that I think is really worth noting is the material Piaget has used. It's a... Uh, a cobalt-based alloy, and they've used it not just because it looks great, but they had to find something else to use because gold would be too fragile, too, too unstable to have components and cases as thin as this. So mm. it was like it's a technical solution as well as an aesthetic solution. And that, I imagine that would have contributed to the weight of the piece, and I think weight is an overstatement because yeah. it has no yes. weight. It weighs 21.7 grams. Yeah, yeah. And that's- Where's my emoji? Uh, this is my emoji right now. <laughs> yeah. That's, and and the, there's another thing that I think is really worth mentioning is that, um, you know, the, the images that have been supplied to us for, of the watch and that will be released, you know, that will come with the press releases, there are three different colors. All that is, is a sample of what is possible because what Piaget has done is they have set up a, a configurating system so that any buyer can choose any of thousands of permutations of different colors, different finishes, different straps and so on. So this is, this is not only an extraordinary watch, this is, you can customize it so it's pretty much a unique piece that you'll be able to get for yourself. Which is, again, if, and that is just built into the offer. It's not an added extra. Mm. Well, look, there's a lot and of offer it there. It says a lot about where watchmaking is going, what, what collectors are looking for. They don't want something called a limited edition. They want mm. something that really resonates with them. And if they can configure their own finishes, colors, and so on, that's worth so much more, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of customers and targeted audience. I, I am not the targeted audience for the Limelight Gala, and yet I, I would count myself among its biggest fans. This is a watch that I think is as uh, iconic and singular a design as a tank, as a, a Datejust. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's, it's amazing to see how Piaget has taken a design that was so far ahead of its time when it was first conceived. The round, the round case version was in the 1960s and the oval case version was in the 1970s. Those designs were so far ahead of their time that even now they look avant-garde. Um, and yes. I just love what they've done with this new one with the graduated uh, sapphires and diamonds. And let me just, I'll just check my note here. You get 20 diamonds and 22 sapphires. Mm. Um, and they've developed a new setting for them. That's, so they're not only graduated in size, but the setting almost disappears under the stone. So you don't even see, you barely see the metal at all. You just see the light of the stones. Um, the patrimony which has, it's almost like the, the yin and yang of precious stones is, is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. And you know, Piaget has developed such strong jewelry skills over the decades, not forgetting that they were a watchmaker before anything, but they have developed such strong jewelry skills 
such strong gold working skills. I mean, that beautiful texturing on the bracelet. Um, mm. When you feel those bracelets, they, they feel as soft as a satin ribbon. They are, they are really works of high jewelry uh, mm. in the best sense of the word. And then and that's, the colors. That is you know, hand. So that, uh, we like, saw the... Uh, we saw the jewellers at SIHH in other years showing how painstaking that bracelet finish is to achieve. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, well, it's an amazing piece. And, um, you know, even though it's only, it's o only, we say only 32 millimetres, but the design is so strong that on the wrist it looks bigger and it has a lot more presence than, than, your, than many other 32 millimetre watches. Yes. Well, I think it's, it's, two, it's, it's two models that really play to Piaget's great strengths. And, you know, again, I, I think uh, they're both watches that are, that are powerful on the wrist in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, they're both very, very powerful statements of what Piaget is really good at. Mm -hmm. Sandra, thank you so much for guiding us through that. Yeah. Thank you cool. so much, and let's let's look forward to um, seeing <laughs> seeing each other IRL very soon. Indeed, thanks, Sandra. Here's hoping. <laughs> <laughs> IWC. Now, before we get into uncovering the new collection, which is all about the Portuguese, I have received a mystery parcel from IWC today, and the promise was simply that it would get me in the mood. That's a very broad promise, so I don't know what's at play here. Uh, I have had a little peek. <laughs> it's got me in the mood for one thing, which is Portuguese chronographs. Here we have a beautiful example of one. I'm going to change up what I'm wearing just so that the... Just so that we're really in theme here, because this year's collection is all about the Portuguese. So this is a 41 millimeter gold chronograph. Oh, gorgeous, really lush black sunray dial with recessed subdials, an absolutely stunning piece and perfect little companion. Switch out the BP for this next little section because we have a lot to talk about. The Portuguese is a collection that we have discussed previously with David Cipher from IWC. I, while I put this on very clumsily, uh, am going to throw to that footage now where we asked David about the origins of the Portuguese collection. The Time and Tide Home Delivery Watch Fair has a brief interruption because we, uh, in late breaking news, can welcome the CEO of IWC, Chris Granger Hare, to the Home Delivery Watch Fair. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Andrew, thank you, how are you? <laughs> well, thanks. I haven't, I haven't read your article yet on the um, which action stars are wearing which watches. I just very much hope that you haven't got Jason Statham in there with this one Rolex that he wore in one film, even though he owns and buys all his IWCs himself and wears them in all the other movies. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit of a, uh, a Richemont man. He loves the Panerai too, doesn't he? Yeah, but uh, I mean, that's obviously with uh, uh, The Rock here, really. I mean, it, the rock, it, it's our sort of internal um, CEO joke because we text each other images of The Rock's wearing and The Rock wearing uh, various watches. So it just sort of goes around the whole time. You have almost every single yeah. brand covered, but it's true that he, he mostly wears Panorama these days. That's true. But Jason, yeah. in, in um, that City Shark movie, what was it called? The Meg. In the Meg. That was actually his. Uh, um, uh, that was his personal watch as well, so it, it, it does come up time and again. So, and we're not sponsoring yeah. them. Either. The concept here is that in a time of uh, restricted movement, that we actually break down some barriers and bring the watch fair to the people. That's the general idea. I mean, we're all uh, getting used to uh, completely new ways of communicating, I guess, through this uh, experience. We're all now proficient Zoom users and the Zoom uh, virtual background users. So. Uh, like yours, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually our office, would you believe? This is uh, where we'd usually be operating from. Yeah, this is also my office. That's where I'm usually operating from. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask you for a wristwatch check, um, but you just did that by accident. What are yeah, we wearing? Sorry, that's, it's the uh, Safari today, the um, big pilot tribute to 5002 Safari from a couple of years ago. Yes, why that one? 
Right? It's, it, it's the one that matches the shoes. So. <laughs> No, I mean, but is that your first consideration that the strap and the shoes yeah. every guy has their own thing so today i was a bit torn you know i was in between the uh, perpetual calendar rodeo drive and the blue dial but he obviously yes. actually it goes with the trousers right? but then you know in the end i opted for the uh, the safari because you've got a better overall color coordination there so the gentleman's problems okay. Well, now let's let's move to the territory we love so much and that we miss uh, more than we ever thought we could, which is wristwatches. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about, and this this is almost too good to be true because there's been so little talk of new watches yeah. and new collections. This is one of my first conversations about a new collection in 2020, which is crazy. Yeah. This is this couldn't be a happier place for me. I'm talking to the, the man himself about IWC, a brand I love. Tell me about uh, 2020. What do we have in store? Yeah, so 2020 uh, is all about the Portuguese collection. It's, it's really the collection that's most closely at the heart of uh, IWC's DNA. And I really think that goes back to our very strong connection with water. And that connection started with Florentine Arista Jones back in 1868, crossing the Atlantic Ocean to set up IWC here on the banks of a river. You know, it's the River Rhine, and he actually used the energy from the river to power his factory directly. So we're directly uh, connected uh, via basically a, a, um, a sort of mill wheel to uh, to uh, the, the river, and we still today, 152 years later, get our river from the hydropower station, um, our power from the hydropower station, which is just 300 meters down the road here. So it's a very direct connection to water there. And then, of course, he built a lot of um, very precise pocket watch movements for the American market, and that soon meant that he had a reputation for that precision, which led to IWC pocket watches being used as deck observation watches. And that navigation watches on, on ships and boats all over the place and that then was the basis for two Portuguese importers coming to Schaffhausen in the 1930s and asking for marine chronometer precision wristwatches. The only way that our watchmakers and our engineers could meet that brief was to put an oversized pocket watch movement into a wristwatch and that created the Portuguese 325, the original Portuguese from 1939 which then Ironically, was not import, exported to uh, to Portugal, but actually to, to Odessa in Ukraine and to other Eastern Europe and Portugal only later. But really, that defined the DNA of the Portuguese. It was that oversized case, that clear legible dial with the Arabic numerals and the foy hands, and then the marine chronometer precision in the pocket watch movement. And that is a DNA that really developed into uh, arguably one of the most recognizable designs in the watch industry with the Portuguese chronograph, uh, which was introduced by Günter Blumlein in, in 1998, first as a as a, a, a ratrapont and then later as the chronograph. So and this year we're really extending that collection and we have three main pillars to that collection, which by the way is a 100% in-house movement collection. All the movements manufactured in our new manufacturing center here close to Schaffhausen. And we actually feature three complete in-house different chronograph movements in that single collection. So there's quite a range. And the three pillars are, we have the icons that is starts with a 40 millimeter automatic which is very very closely related to the dna of the original portuguese with a small second like six o'clock and a very pure dial layout no date and a sapphire glass case bag with our in-house 82 caliber automatic movement and then we have a completely re-engineered iconic portuguese chronograph with our 69 caliber inside a sapphire glass case bag new folding clasp uh, and, and strap um, that comes in all the classic colors, but also a new burgundy and a dark green. And then we have some new models in our classic seven days automatic as well with a 52 caliber. And we have a second pillar in the collection that we refer to as sort of the nautical instrument inspired part of the collection. And that starts with a new perpetual calendar. And that's a new perpetual calendar using Kurt Klaus's iconic uh, PPC module, um, which actually is now in 42 millimeters with that 82 caliber movement. So completely redesigned movement configuration and gives you a complete Portuguese look and feel to the case but makes it just a bit more variable because you reduce it from 44 to 42 and again in very classic color codes but also in stainless steel. And there's actually a story I quite like about this one because we tried to figure out you know you have the, the moon disc at uh, six o'clock uh, on yes. this one and there's, there's a couple of different techniques in the watch industry how you get these 3D um, um, curved moon shapes, you know, one of the classic systems is to do electroplating where it's additive electroplating that builds up that moon shape and gives that polished look. 
but we weren't quite quite happy with all the, the systems uh, that were available. So we actually re-engineered that completely. And they are now um, actually machined from a solid piece of gold. So the entire moon disk, including the stars and the polished moon, is completely done from a single piece of moon, a uh, single piece of gold here in House of Chaffasen. And then we temporal path print the dark blue night sky precisely in between every angle of the stars and the moon. So it's, it's, I mean, when you look at it with a magnifying glass, the precision you need in the printing process to get right in there into that <laughs> little dip, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, when I first saw it, I said, you're kidding me. You're not, you're not doing that with temporal printing. Said, yeah. We just worked it out. I was like, geez. <laughs> so that's, that's like these little beautiful details. And mm. then we have a whole collection of complications um, that are really inspired by that nautical universe, which are all done in gold cases, blue dials, and then come on a woven calf leather strap, really uh, inspired by sort of the, the, the rope theme from, from, from boats. And uh, this includes some of the uh, automatic and chrono models, but also then a big perpetual calendar 44. And then we're combining the uh, tourbillon uh, functions with perpetual calendar and tourbillon chronograph. We have two flying tourbillon references for the, the PBC tourbillon and the chronograph tourbillon with the flying tourbillon at six o'clock, which is a hacking tourbillon, tourbillon stop. And those are uh, each limited to 50 pieces in gold and we do 50 pieces in platinum as well. And then finally, the third pillar is really the, the sports elegant um, pillar of the collection. That's the, uh, the new third generation yacht club. So the yacht club was first introduced as a sports Portuguese chronograph um, with increased waterproofing and so on back in 2010. And that was 45 millimeters, and then we reduced the diameter to 43 and changed the proportions completely. And it's always been one of those things that I wanted to do. I wanted to bring that back to its original slender proportions and launch it as a collection that is on metal bracelet uh, predominantly. So with, with the Yacht Club, we now have 44 millimeters. We have a completely redesigned case style configuration and a completely new bracelet with fine adjustment system. And on top of that, we have there a, a, a absolutely new function, uh, which is a moon and tide display on the Yacht Club automatic moon and tide. Uh, and Can I one, interrupt you yeah. briefly there, Chris, and just say... Sorry, I keep going on. <laughs> you know, no, I just want to say, you know the name of who you're talking to. What is our, what is our, what are we called? Sorry? Time yeah, tide, yes, of course, yes. <laughs> this is the watch we've waited for all these years. Absolutely, yeah, you've got time and tide on that one. That's for sure. I think Vutalainen did a, a time and tide, he did a tide indicator with some waves at one point. Yeah. Um, but this is the first big box brand to do a time and tide watch. So I want to hear every detail because I'm sure there's a lot of facts in this one too. Because there is that display at 12. That play, talk me through it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's got two displays, display at 12 and display at 6, uh, based on an automatic movement. And we have at the top, we have our classic cigar cutter uh, double moon display, which shows the correct uh, phase of the moon in the northern and southern hemispheres. Uh, and then on top of that, it indicates whether you have a neap tide or a spring tide. So that's the more or less expressed high tide, depending on the constellation of moon, earth, and sun. Uh, depending on the gravitational pull, you have either higher tides or lower tides. So it gives you that indication, which is synchronized with the moon. And then at six o'clock, and this is all set on the single uh, crown at three o'clock, you have a high tide, low tide indicator, which you set to your current location to give you the first marker of high tide. And then it follows the tide cycle of 12 hours, 24 minutes uh, correctly for that location so that you always have the high tide and low tide point indication. So that's a, a perfect uh, function for navigators, sailors, surfers, uh, people with big families who want to check if there is a beach or not at any given moment in time. So there's plenty of use cases for that, but it's beautifully integrated in that yacht club and, and I think it's a stunning piece. I absolutely love buying it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. We went over time. Um, and, and you're a very punctual man, so I, I apologize. I asked the others who are going to give me a hard time, so <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> now, one of the questions that you guys always ask when we're at fairs is, what's it like when you're actually there? Is it a completely luxurious affair? Is there champagne and food just on tap? I have to say, it watches and wonders at the Pal Expo in Geneva. That's exactly what happens. So I'm getting a little peckish now. We're about you know, we're, we've, we're a couple of brands down. Let's go and have lunch. Let's go and see how this happens. The other difference between SIHH and Basel is that at Basel, you go hungry. You eat air, man. But at SIHH, you sit down. <clears throat> you read this handy menu. Buffalo mozzarella, kingfish, or I could just have sushi. I think sushi. 
This is not set up at all. Thank you very much. So yes, it appears that there is such a thing as a free lunch and a free sushi in that case, but it's rare that we'd actually get the chance to, to get out of a booth and have it. So that was a moment that I had to engineer in order to have lunch that day. Up next is Cartier, the brand that recently released the Santos Dumont and gave people what they wanted, which is that same slim case profile, but with a mechanical movement. It's only 0.2 millimeters thicker than the quartz model released last year. And if anyone's gonna take the conversation from here, it's not me, it's Nicholas Kenyon, our very own Cartier fanboy. He loves the brand in so many ways. We're gonna to throw to him now on Zoom to find out what he thinks of the latest collection. Hello, Nicholas. Hello. This is our new normal. I know, on other sides of a screen, as opposed yes. to sharing a desk. I know. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from doing what we do, I suppose. It doesn't, and it doesn't stop you from being the biggest Cartier fan in this building when we're usually in it together. That's, that's true, yeah, yeah. Guilty as charged. Um, now tell me, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, reveal this last week with the Santos Dumont. Um, what yep. do Cartier have in store at Watches and Wonders? So they've essentially springboarded off the Cartier Santos Dumont XL launch that they did a couple of weeks back. Um, that was essentially the inclusion of a manual winding movement uh, in a very similar case shape to the Santos Dumont collection from 2019. Um, and now uh, for Watches and Wonders, they're going to be releasing four new limited editions. So while they're not going to be in full scale production, um, they are absolutely stunning, if I say so myself. Um, <laughs> there's three which are relatively similar in terms of all having sword hands. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just run through them very quickly. Uh, there's the Santos Dumont Le Brasil, uh, limited to 100 pieces. That's in platinum and has a very good looking uh, ruby cabochon on the crown. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the silver dial combined with the platinum case works really, really well. Then we've got the Santos Dumont La Baladeus. Something strange happened there because your, your voice slowed down. I think it might have been a, a buffering error. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's the Santos Dumont uh, Baladeus. It's limited to 300 pieces. Um, that's in a yellow gold case with the, the blue cabochon that we're, we're used to seeing. Um, and it's got matching blued sword hands. So really, really nice and nice high contrast against the champagne dial. Mm. Um, the third, the third one in this series is the uh, Le Fourteen B, uh, which is a black dial with a kind of darker, darker grey strap. Um, it's got a gold bezel, um, and it's it's two tone against the case, basically. So it is just two tone. It is unashamedly two tone, isn't it? Wow. It is, yeah. No, I think it. Um, I think it looks really good. And and the uh, the hands again, nice high contrast against the dial, um, and yeah, with the kind of the blue cabochon that we're that we're used to seeing in in many of Cartier watches. And what do we have last, Nick? Uh, last up is probably the most special release. It's limited to just thirty pieces. Um, it's the Santos Dumont La Demoiselle. Um, and this one is again in platinum. It comes with two different strap options. Um, and most interestingly for this is the kind of really sort of bone ivory dial with a, with a fine gear shape pattern in the center. Um, and true to some of the original Cartier Santos Dumont watches from the 1920s, this one actually has reggae hands. So the kind of apple hands with the circle of the finish. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the most kind of authentic or, or true to the original uh, Cartier Santos Dumont releases. Um, and again, it makes it a little bit special with the, uh, with the red cabochon, uh, the ruby cabochon in the crown. I think it, it looks fantastic. It seems to be quite an assortment that you get with the watch. It's not just the watch, is it? No, that's right. So it's, uh, it can't be sold separately, um, as, as they've let us know. You've got to, you've got to get it with the, with the full Santos Dumont box. 
Um, in that you get a, a travel, travel pouch, um, which is a brown alligator leather, which looks quite nice. Um, and then matching, uh, matching cufflinks. So the, the cufflinks sort of similar to the bezel with those exposed screws. Um, and on the inside of that is a red tiger's eye um, and they're made in white gold. So uh, we don't have pricing on this one yet, but I imagine that it's not gonna be, uh, not gonna be cheap, but mm. yeah. It's a very good looking thing. Before we go, Nick, what is it about Cartier? Tell me, tell the people. Um, it's just the simplicity, the strength of the design. I mean, it, as I said with the last one, it's the most true to the original from over a hundred years ago and it almost hasn't changed an iota. It still looks fantastic. Um, it's, yeah, it's just the strength of the design. If it's that good, why change it? Mm. Well, they haven't really. However, I would say this is there's been an unusual explosion of colour and texture and uh, dial and strap variations as well as cabochon variations. It's it's a it's a little bit more, uh, shall we say, um, strident than usual for Cartier. Yeah, I mm. think I think um, when when it goes to the, the the first three pieces that we spoke about, um, the dial variations are quite interesting. Um, I'd assume that the red cabochon uh, denotes the platinum case, as that's consistent across the Le Brazil and, uh, and the Dem La Demoiselle uh, mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, a, a, few different, a few different kind of switch ups there, but again, they're not going too wild. I don't think anybody's, uh, anybody's gonna say the champagne dials, you know, very, very extravagant, um, nor a kind of slate gray dial or a, or a black dial, I think they're, yeah, they're slightly different, but still, still very much within the within the train tracks of Cartier. And what's your pick? Uh, it's got to be the La Demoiselle. Um, yeah, those Breguet hands, the red the red cabochon, and a platinum case. It's a mm. winner. And that strap as well. Nice strap. Yeah, it looks fantastic. So you mm. get you get both straps uh, with the watch. So. Yeah, depending on what the outfit looks like. I don't know if it's a, you know, a tuxedo or maybe you're wearing a, a white linen sort of uh, suit to <laughs> Safari the races, suit. Like <laughs> maybe, maybe you then go to the, uh, to, the, to the cream strap. But yeah, I think they look really, really nice. Fantastic. Well, we dream of getting out and about, going to races and wearing uh, things that aren't uh, corduroy or uh, fleece. So dare to dream, hey, Nick? <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be back amongst it soon. But in the meantime, mm. zooming in. Zooming in. Thanks, Nick. No worries. Thank you, Andrew. I'll uh, yeah, chat to you soon. It's time to take a trip up Mont Blanc. Now, there are three collections that have been released this year across the Star Legacy, the 1858 and the Heritage collections. And I'd like to start with the 1858 because the Geospheres model is, in my opinion, the most successful and most characterful of recent Mont Blanc releases. It is something of a call to adventure in the way this watch comes together. It has, obviously, uh, it's a large watch. It has uh, a busy dial in the sense that there are things happening. And yet it does have, for me, this simple masculine power. We've seen several variations over the years, all of them in this rustic masculine type of world where we had moss green dials, we had uh, a bronze on a bun strap, and now we have what many argue is always the best variation, a blue dial. Now this isn't just a standard uniform blue, we have a blue that is graduated from black at the fringes to a lighter blue in the center, which again, with that call to adventure that the watch seems to have to me and others, it evokes a night sky. It has that sort of, that sense of, uh, of blue deepening as you get closer to the horizon. Now, this watch comes on a blue leather strap with contrast stitching or on a steel and titanium beads of rice strap. Next up is the Mont Blanc Heritage Collection. And I've been a little greedy here because I probably should have spread my three choices over the three collections, including Star Legacy, but I'm gonna pick two from the Heritage Collection because I think that there's certainly one line extension that everyone's been craving, which is that salmon dial 
heritage model now receiving a chronograph treatment and not just any chronograph in appropriate vintage style this is a mono pusher bicompax chronograph which looks the part and i think it's the perfect way to extend on uh, an on-trend dial color that again suits this sort of masculine uh, heritage type of world that this collection is all about the third model is none of those things it is just for me i looked at I keep looking at this watch <laughs> because it strikes an Australian tone. It's green and gold, but it's also the tones of this, this very lush forest green and then an unapologetic yellow gold. You know, there are lots of variations of green and gold. We've seen a Rolex day date, which is very much an olive and a rose gold. This is not, not those things. It's primary. It's, it's bold. And yet it's also, again, that classic refined um, heritage style. So, Montblanc has knocked it out of the park with those two. And you can discover the star legacy on Time and Tide over the year, but they're my three picks from this collection. And what did A. Langer and Zerner bring to the table this year? I'm glad you asked because there's actually two significant releases. The first is the Zeitwerk Minute Repeater. Now this is a reimagined minute repeater in terms of the audible indication of time. Instead of indicating quarter hours with a double strike, it indicates 10 minute intervals with a double strike. So we have single strike for hours, double strike for 10 minutes, and single strike for minutes. So it's for them a completely reimagined way to audibly indicate the time. We also see a really lush blue dial that is you know, hard to describe in, in words, it's beautiful. And we have a price tag of around about 450,000 euro. So certainly a highly complicated watch by the best in the business. Secondly, and perhaps most notably, is the extension of the Odysseus. Now the Odysseus was a surprise, let's not beat around the bush, a steel sports watch by Elanga and Zerna with an integrated bracelet. Now the first model was in steel and that was around the $41,000 Aussie mark. This new model is in white gold and it's around the 62K mark. And it follows the path of very popular steel sports models into more casual and sporty straps. We have an integrated rubber strap and we have an integrated leather strap. Now they're both very dramatic in the way they change the look of the watch. So if your first impression of the Odysseus was that it was a rather conservative and stiff upper lip version of a sports watch, then certainly these are pushing the boat out and, and bringing it into a much more identifiable steel sports territory like the Royal Oak in terms of the, those different bracelet executions. Now look, obviously not being at the fairs, I miss the watches. But I also watching this video that describes where we're meant to be, I notice also how much I miss the people. There's a little man hug that happens there with uh, a colleague from Cartier. There's uh, a lot of contact with other journalists that we have, whether that's just catching up or you know, having a beer in the, in the media lounge. It's a thing that I will never take for granted again. And that is my nostalgic segue into Panerai, the first brand that introduced me to luxury watches many years ago. It was the first watch I ever saw that gave me a real gut punch and a real thought that actually 5,000 or $6,000 for a watch back then is something that I wanna do. So it's a sentimental brand for me always. Now it is all about the Luminol this year for Panerai and we have two key models to explore. The first is a boutique only limited edition of 270 pieces, the PAM 1117. Now this has a few interesting quirks about it. Firstly, the luminosity is enhanced. So you will see that the loom here is really quite exceptionally bright. Secondly, the warranty period has been extended to a, a kind of a mind boggling 70 years. So I think for the average person, this is certainly a lifetime warranty. Uh, it is constructed of titanium and weighs only 100 grams, and it is a 44 millimeter luminal. So again, not a, a super sized watch. Now the second model is the Panerai Luminal Marinat Fibrotech. 
Now, FibroTech is yet another material innovation from Panerai that weaves basalt fibers, which is a first for the watch industry. And the FibroTech properties are impressive as it is 60% lighter than steel. Again, I have to say this, I didn't appreciate what I had when I had it, which was holding watches like this next collection in my hand. I pine to do that right now because I'm looking at the new Vacheron Constantin collection and I am hurting because this, trying to take my eyes off it on the screen right now, this overseas ultra thin perpetual calendar in yellow gold with a lush blue dial looks just divine. Now it begins to, or it continues this nice competition that Vacheron have with Audemars Piguet for uh, ultra thin perpetual calendars. We have seen some pretty exciting moves from AP in that regard over the last five years. This really joins that fray, as well as adding, again, I just think that classic combination of yellow gold and a blue dial. Some details of the watch. Now, Vacheron have just not held back in the way that they have finished this dial. They, there are three separate finishings, a circular satin finishing, we have a snailed finishing, and we have a sunburst finishing, which again, it looks like a simple blue dial from a distance, but as you inspect this watch um, up close and in different lighting conditions, you will see all of these different refractions and, and light play happening. Also, we have, of course, a uh, Geneva seal certification. We have 276 components, and we have all of these beautiful components fitted into a 4.05 millimeter thin watch. So we have an absolute winner there in the ultra thin perpetual calendar overseas. Up next, brown. Hardly setting the world on fire, you would think, as a dial color. However, here, when paired with a pink gold case in the 1956, with blue, little blue elements peeping through on the moon phase of one model, this is utterly sumptuous in the way that this comes together. So the 1956 has probably not had the impact that Vacheron would have liked since its release a couple of years ago as a sort of an accessible Vacheron piece. However, I think adding some pizzazz, adding some extra warmth and character to the watch via this brown dial is an awesome move. My pick here is the calendar model with moon phase for that simple reason that the moon phase does bring in another navy color element, which again, just makes this color palette of pink gold, a really lush um, chocolatey brown with blue. It's a stunning color combination. Lastly, I simply cannot ignore La Musique de Tomp model, which is the music of time. And one of the jokes that is bandied around when you see a complicated Langer, when you see a complicated Vacheron or Audemars Piguet, especially when there's an open case back, is what a shame you can't wear this watch both ways. Well, this watch gets around that problem. It is indeed a double-sided watch. You can wear both ways thanks to an ingenious strap system. So what do you have on each side? On the traditional side of the watch, you have the hours, the chronograph hours and measurements as per normal. However, on the flip side, if you choose to wear it that way, you have the astronomical complications. Now there are 24 complications in total. I'm not going to read through them all. This is a watch that yet again finds new ways to surprise and delight. I think most interesting and most exciting for watch lovers that are appreciating horology at this level is that there's a degree of playfulness and a degree of real practicality about the fact that you can wear this watch on both sides. So there you have it, the first ever time and tired home delivery virtual watch fair. <laughs> I actually feel nearly as tired <laughs> as I do after five days of, of trawling around the booths. So in that way, it feels familiar. And on that note, how do we finish every watch fair we've ever been to since 2013. We finish by, at our most weak, most vulnerable, most tired point, we finish with a list. I want to start this with a warning actually, because this video will contain traces of two things. 
One will be traces of amazing, that I promise you. And also maybe slight traces of fatigue because fatigue. it is wow. the last yeah. day. More, more than trace elements of fatigue, I think that's gonna be the, the prime ingredient of this <laughs> little is. concoction. But we're rolling up our sleeves quite literally. Oh, um, and we I've got French are, cuffs, I can't. Okay, <laughs> just stay as you are. We're gonna get into our top five right now. We sift through our strongest first impressions and come up with the watches that we think have really cut through for us out of the often hundreds and hundreds that we handle over the course of the fair. So I've done the same thing today. I have chosen the five watches from 2020 Watches and Wonders that I cannot wait to meet in the medal. First up is the Vacheron Constantin Overseas Perpetual Calendar Ultra Thin. Now look, I am a sucker for yellow gold and rich blue as this is, and over the years I have allocated many list placements to watches with that combination simply because it does something to me. However, I find the attention to detail on the, on the dial is, is what makes Vacheron so highly sought and it what's, it's what makes this model something that will be a feast for the eyes, which is that snailed finishing, the circular satin finishing, and the sunburst finishing, the combination of those three things on the most viewed part of the watch, as well as the offer of a four millimeter thin perpetual calendar is just too much for me. It's, it's taking the biscuits. Um, the second watch on my list is the extension of the uh, Bowman Mercier Clifton Baumatic, which is up there with the most handsome dials and handsome of the classic watch oeuvre on the market. It is a stunning watch without a complication. However, with a moon phase and a day and a date and, and a $6,900 price tag Aussie I am very tempted. My third pick is another blue dial, and in fact, it's another graduated blue dial in the same way that the uh, Clifton Day Date Moon Phase is. We have the Mont Blanc Geospheres. I've always been a fan of this watch. In green, I thought it was very niche, and while green is an on trend dial color, that wasn't quite enough for me. In bronze with the Bund strap, it really went to <laughs> Uh, a masculine uncle uh, orienteer type of vibe. The blue dial is really quite stunning, the way that this evokes the night sky. And with all of these functional looking sub dials and with its heft, this really is a call to adventure. I'm, I'm down for it. Up next is the IWC Moon and Tide Portuguesa. It's quite simple, it has the time it has the tides. It's actually a very attractive watch as well. Not that we needed that. Lastly, it's a battle of the calendars. Do I award it to the Vacheron Constantin 56 complete calendar or the Gégé Le Coutre master calendar? I'm going to go with the latter simply because Sandra Lane talked me into it. As Sandra described to me the classic and yet contemporary refinement of the master calendar, and as I noted the symmetry of the dial myself, I was won over. This is a beautifully executed, classic masculine watch with, again, that somewhat quaint uh, configuration of the calendar that appeals to me very much. So there you have it. The first, maybe the last <laughs> virtual watch fair we will see. Please let me know what you thought of this longer format in the comments below. It's been great to relax into having a longer format. If that's something you'd like to see more of, please let us know. If you have lasted this long, your retention is impressive and I applaud you. Thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay well, and stay home. For now. Then, let's go out. <laughs>